Hi, Graham. Hi, Sue. Hope you're doing Hello. well. How are you doing? Happy Thanksgiving. You as well. Now, Diane is traveling, so she may join us or may not join us, or she might join us late. So we're waiting for Andrea, I think. I don't see Andrea online. So we'll give that a minute. Graham, do you have kids home? Uh, we have two that live here now, um, believe it or not. Nice. Um, yeah, I mean, the pandemic has actually been a benefit because Will works for Kraft Heinz out of Chicago, but it's all been virtual, so he stays here. And uh, Mary Catherine is working for Des Moines Performing Arts. Oh, uh, that's great. Yeah, and, and they're both, both living downtown. Of course, Connor's deployed and is out somewhere in the Philippine Sea, as best I can tell. Not sure you're allowed to disclose that. Well, that's as most as I know. He was in Guam <laughs> about he was in Guam about ten days ago on a port call, and judging by the Vincent, which is an aircraft carrier that his ship is escorting, they were doing joint operations in the Philippine Sea. So that's just nice. a guess. All right. All right, well, I see that Andrea's on. And so, Michelle, it seems like we have a roll call of four. Is that correct? Uh, yes, that looks like right. I see Andrea. Let us, yeah, let us know if Diane joins us. I sure will. All right, so this is the uh, November 23rd meeting of the Board of Water Works trustees. And starting off on our agenda today, we have a consent agenda, which includes minutes of the October 22nd, October 26th, 2021 meeting, uh, the Board of Waterworks Trustees, minutes for the November 2nd Planning Committee meeting, minutes of the November 9th Finance and Audit Committee meeting, financial statements, list of payments for October 2021, a summary of CEO approved expenditures in excess of $20,000, in our next meeting date, which is, a, is an amended date of December 21st, 2021, I believe. Um, is there a motion for the consent agenda? So moved. And a second? Second. second. And a motion and a second. Ted, do you have anything to add here? Just that there is one CEO approved expenditure this month, Graham, which was related to our ISO 50001 recertification an expense that was budgeted in a prior year. Uh, it's on the list. Excellent. Any questions or comments on this, on the consent agenda? Hearing none, seeing none. Uh, Michelle, will you record a vote, please? Ashburnham? Yes. Bolton? Yes. Gillette? Yes. Hubbard? Yes. And I don't see Diane yet, so. All right. So this moves us into our public comment period. It's an opportunity for members of the public to address the board. I don't know if anyone's online or in the studio there in the uh, office, Michelle, would you let me know? Yes, I actually have three gentlemen in attendance with me today. So I'm gonna turn on the camera and uh, I'll have them state their name address and give me the opportunity to address the board. Thank you. Just a second. It's all technology, right, Michelle? It's terrific. <clears throat> sure. Are we seeing the boardroom? We can see them, yes. Okay, very good. Yeah, I can stand. You sure can. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks for letting me talk. My name is Dennis Spitzer. This is my neighbor, Nick Queasy, Doug Blackburn. Uh, the three of us are here on a matter of somewhat urgency. 
We all own houses. We're all neighbors. We live on South 12th Street. And that's right behind Lincoln High School. Uh, and the problem we have, after talking to Mike McCurran and engineering, he informed me that the three of us are on a private dead in Maine. And the Maine is 80 years old and it's one inch. Not a foot, it's one inch. 80 year old Maine. And I'm guessing from my experience, it's probably galvanized. <clears throat> now, the problem we have is not so much water pressure in our home, it's volume. If my wife is filling the wash machine, I can't get water out of any of my other faucets. You can't use more than one thing in the house at a time. And Doug, Nick, they all have the same problem. If you got a a lawn sprinkler, forget it. Totally useless. Totally. And like I said, I talked to engineering, and they said it's possible that they could replace that main. The problem is, they said it would cost us, the three of us, about $10,000 each, which we don't have. And to put it on our water bill, it would double our water bill every month and it would take at least 10 years to pay it off at $10,000. Um, now I worked, I should say I worked on, I retired from the Des Moines Water Works after 29 years. And that was 29 years I worked in water distribution and I fixed hundreds and hundreds of broken water mains. And I, I can tell you, if this is an old galvanized line, it's long outlived its usefulness. And it's probably so corroded inside, you're lucky if it's a half inch diameter now. And it's getting worse. And our biggest fear is right now, if this main breaks, we have to pay to fix it. And that's going to cost a lot of money. And there's no guarantee a week later it won't wake again. It could cost each each another uh, five, six thousand dollars a piece. Who knows? So I guess what was we are here for is appealing to the board for help. Either help in the financial end of it, maybe cut us a break, or maybe you take care of the whole price, you know. Okay, it's getting urgent because one of these days we're not going to have any water at all. It's getting that close. And we're just fortunate we still got any water now. And we would just like some help from the board and maybe put it at the top of the list on priority as time's running out for us. So, you guys got anything you want to add? Well, I guess the only thing I'd, I'd add is when you talked with Mike from the city there, he said we'd have to connect the two from Bell to what street is that? Is that the one to the south. Oh, uh, is that Loomis? Is that Loomis? Is that? Oh, Loomis was it? I shouldn't know they did. Regardless, they don't want another dead end name. And uh, I'm on the dead end. He's on the dead end, and he's about halfway between the two streets. So if it's we have to connect the two, the, the price is twice. There's a one block section that we live on, and there's only our three houses. And I'm kind of right in the middle of the block from my house to the next street. There's nobody to cast on the line. But I understand Waterworks doesn't want any get in mains. But I know when I worked there, when I worked at Waterworks, they had a program going where they were trying to replace all the two inch lines in the city. And a lot of them two inch lines that they replaced were on cul-de-sacs. And cul-de-sacs generally have seven, eight people, maybe more, and they can share the burden of the price, the cost of it. Or in our case, it's just the three of us bearing the cost. You know, and $10,000 in this economy now with inflation and everything, it, it, it'll be tough for us to come up that kind of money. But we are getting worried that we're either going to run out of water or 
it's going to start breaking on us. And that's going to be really expensive. Ted, do you want to, Ted, or you or Mike want to give us some, some history on this? Uh, I can give you um, some general history, Graham. Uh, Danny, just first of all, I want to say hello. Uh, good to see hello, you Ted. for a very long time. Uh, it's great to see you. Um, Danny and I worked together for many years in, in water distribution, so uh, uh, it's good to see you. Um, the, the private lines like this, uh, they're, they're a little bit problematic. They were put in years ago. We don't allow this process anymore where um, a group of homeowners can run a small private line. And they used to allow that to be done. Um, the homeowners could install, or and more likely the developer who developed the lots could install a private line that was not up to municipal standards. Uh, they could do that. They allowed it. Um, it was more cost effective for them to do that. But Waterworks didn't own it and wouldn't own it. And so they were always responsible for you know, maintenance and repair, which is, is fine when the original owner still owns the house. It becomes challenging 80 years later, as Danny just described, when there's probably two or three generations of homeowners who have lived in these, in these homes. They weren't involved in the decision making at the time. Uh, they were not uh, the beneficiaries of the cost savings uh, at the time. So what we have done historically when, when these come up, sometimes they're leaking and they have to be replaced. Um, members of the board may remember when Leslie Gerhardt was on the board, she had the exact same situation, a private line at her house. And we, we did what we have traditionally done, and that is uh, worked with the homeowners. Um, Waterworks pays a, a portion of the cost, and then the homeowners pay a portion of the cost. And I'll, I'll have to get Mike McKernan to comment on just exactly how that de determination is made. But, but we feel that we have the ability to pay a portion of that cost, Graham, as the Waterworks, because um, these customers, frankly, have been paying the same water rate as everyone else um, who, you know, and, and there's a component in our, in our rate for capital uh, replacement. Um, the difference is that theoretically there wasn't the investment in the beginning when the development was made to install a municipal main that would last, you know, 100 years or whatever the case may be. So, We've come up with this cost share approach, and that I think is what Danny is describing: is that um, you know, ten thousand dollars is a significant amount of money. There's no question, but thirty thousand dollars probably isn't twenty-five percent of the cost of, of putting that main in there, and Waterworks was gonna, would cover the rest. So, um, I'm going to ask Mike if he can share with us um, any more detail on that and see if. Uh, we can get kind of the full picture and then see if the board has other questions. Mike? Yeah, let me offer just a couple things here. Um, Dennis is correct about the age and the people that are connected to it. And Ted is also correct. It's, it's, a, it's, a, private, it's a private main. And when we've ran into these things in the past, um, we try and look for opportunities where we can maybe get some waterworks own water main in front of these homes that comes with some expense to us and typically again what we've done in the past each one of these situations is a little different but the situation here on southwest 12th is is pretty it's fairly straightforward i know the numbers aren't really pleasing to hear for the for the homeowners but typically what we do is there's two components to the uh the homeowners uh cost here uh, the first is going to be a, a service transfer. Um, you know, they have an existing service to an old main, and now we need to transfer a service to a new main. These are typically bid items in a water main replacement contract. Our most recent water main replacement contract, at least as of September, when Dennis and I spoke, you know, an opposite side service transfer alone was $4,600. The other thing that we typically ask homeowners to participate in at a small level, relatively small level, is usually a fee of anywhere from 2,500 to 5,000 to help offset some of the costs here associated with 
um, completing the installation of a waterworks own water main in, in front of their property. So in this case, we had an opposite side service transfer cost of about 4,600. And I estimated another three to $5,000 potentially for, um, you know, cost participation by the, 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 the customer. Um, so that's how we came up with an estimate between seven and 10,000 for the homeowner, each homeowner. Uh, what we envisioned doing here on this block of Southwest 12th was installing about 300 foot of eight inch main, which we guess is gonna cost probably a little over $100,000. So it's this balance between, um, it's a private main, it was built that way. Um, what's the balance between the utilities obligation to put, put main in the street uh, versus uh, and, and their level of participation in that. So um, we're certainly happy to discuss this more, uh, but th those are kind of the, the background information, uh, not an un unusual situation and kind of what's been proposed is something we've certainly done in the past. It still lands on this, you know, seven to 10,000 for a homeowner and that's a, that's a tough message to hear. Andrea, Joel, Sue, do you have any questions or comments here? Sue, go ahead. Question, I'll go ahead for Sue. The question that I have is I know often we have a new, um, someone who's going to be purchasing a home and they call Waterworks to find out, you know, um, what have the water bills been running? And I'm sure we disclose that. My question is, is are we making these homeowners that are on these private lines aware of this kind of risk? And I know that's not addressing what the three uh, individuals in the room are asking. I'm just thinking how much of a problem do we have as a utility um, on some of these private lines and what are we doing long-term to, to make sure people are aware? Am I able to speak? I actually did just purchase my house and I didn't know. So I, I actually just been living in this house for three months, uh, closed in August. And Dennis, you know, he came over and introduced himself and said, did you know you're on a private water line? And at the time we hadn't known that because that would have been a, a either something we would negotiate with in our sales cost or, you know. Well, none know. of us when we purchased our houses were notified <clears throat> that it was a private line. We found out after the fact, all of us. Yeah, and I, I'm going to guess that that's pretty typical, Sue, in response to your question. The, the challenge that we have is that people don't know to ask those questions, and we certainly don't have any way of knowing that the house is being sold, and so there's there's no opportunity for us to reach out and, and advise people, and it's, it's a similar situation with lead service lines. You know, if people call and ask, we can give them information um, but we, as a rule, answer the specific question that they ask, you know, what, how old is it? When was it connected? What's a typical water bill? Um, we don't offer additional information that they don't ask for. Um, I might ask Amy or Laura if they have any, um, anything to add there. Frankly, I don't think we get very many calls from customers asking questions about water service. Um, during the purchase of a home. Uh, Amy or Laura, can you validate that or correct me if I'm wrong? I would agree with everything you just said, Ted. Um, it's pretty rare, frankly, for incoming customers and certainly before the execution of a sale to ask those types of questions. If they do, you know, we certainly would do the research and provide that information, but we don't often have the opportunity. When they're, when they're calling for new service, it's often they've already purchased it. Would it be possible, Amy, to uh, for those owners that have a private service line to somehow mark that on their bill so that people that, that are in this special circumstance, either on their monthly bill or, or maybe periodically be able to inform them of this thing they may not know? I think we could certainly explore that. Um, we would have to integrate a couple systems. You know, the private main designation is not in our billing system um, necessarily in a way that would be retrievable by the bill, but we could certainly look at it. 
Yeah, I'd like you to do that. I mean, I, Sue brings up a very good point. I think that if we could make some sort of an effort so folks like these three gentlemen aren't surprised by it when there's a problem, that might be helpful. Sure. Joel, you were gonna ask a question. Almost right. unneeded now. Sue asked almost exactly the question I had. I'll take a slightly different angle though. Um, I think we've kind of discussed, you know, when someone buys a home, does Waterworks give them some kind of, you know, actual notice, send them a letter or something like that. Um, that's one uh, aspect. I'm wondering, and maybe John has thoughts on this, if there's some kind of record notice a homeowner would have um, when they buy their home, is it in the title report? Um, is there something on record that when you buy a home, uh, you're, you would see, and, and you may not, a lot of homeowners may not look closely enough to notice it, but they do would have noticed if it was recorded somewhere. So I'm curious if there's any kind of um, record notice that homeowners would typically receive in this situation. Uh, Joel, I'll, I'll answer that. I don't think typically uh, any notification would be recorded routinely with respect to the, the title on the nature of the main to which the service line is connected. Um, there might be problems um, indeed if the waterworks set out in a program now to record those kinds of instruments. They might be regarded as a detriment to title or something like that. So it's a, I don't think there's a ready solution to this in the real estate records. And I, I'm not thinking so much as forward looking something for us to start doing, but um, just, you know, in, in regard to our position that, you know, this is uh, something the homeowners, uh, you know, have to help pay for, I'm, you know, curious if they would have had some kind of notice uh, in the public record when they bought their home historically in the past. <clears throat> and the other thing I don't know is there might be some disclosure obligation between buyer and seller, but uh, obviously that's not a part of the, that's not a matter in which the waterworks can intervene or be involved. And I would also assume that the previous owner knew themselves. I don't know that it's, it's a foregone conclusion that they knew. Um, yeah. I know that Leslie had lived in her house for many years and she did not know. Um, I don't know when Danny, for example, became aware, but, you know, it's not unlike um, a customer who moves into any house of, of an age that has an 80 year old service line. If it leaks or doesn't provide enough capacity, they're, you know, they're probably looking at eight or $10,000 to replace that service line. And we don't notify them when they move into their house that they have an 80 year old service line. Um, this is different because this is the main out in the street. And then they also have a service line that's probably, you know, 80 years old. So this is, this is different for them, but it's, it's similar in that, um, we don't notify people of the current situation when they buy a house primarily because we don't know they're buying the house. I, and, oh, go ahead, Andrea. please go Andrea. So um, I understand that, oh, my, my question is, is, does our third party insurance provider cover these private lines? And I understand that assumes that something has happened to them um, for that insurance to kick in, but is that something that is covered by that third party insurance? It is not. And in fact, is it, it is expressly excluded uh, as jointly owned. So jointly owned, um, pipelines are not covered by home serve. Ted, I think, you know, as Amy and Laura look into, you know, how we might be able to notify customers either on a regular or one-time basis, uh, I'd be interested to see what you guys come back from on a staff standpoint. And if Joel's willing to kind of, you know, th help you think through from a legal standpoint about, um, and Rick, obviously, too, but um, you know, what we can do here so that this doesn't happen to, to other homeowners like these three gentlemen. Um, 
to the to their specific point and their specific problems, Ted, uh, where where are there meters in relation to these lines? I mean, this private line hooks into the main and then comes down and splits off into three places. Where where's the meter live? I uh, there's one meter and it's probably about oh 20 feet south of Doug's house, and he's the one on the south end. But so Danny, I, I, I'm I'm sorry, there's one meter for all three houses. Well, I should say it's a shut off. Yeah. Not, we all got a meter at the house. Yeah. So, yeah. so where the metering, are the meters? The metering would be like a typical residential house, Graham. So I assume right. just looking at the GIS, these houses are close to the to the street. So a meter pit would not generally be required. So I assume they each have a meter in their basement or their crawl space. Or right. Okay. That would be typical. <clears throat> So, you know, you keep you keep referring to that as a one-inch water main. In my book, that's not a that's not a water main. That's just another surface with three other surfaces coming off of it. Yeah, Ted, you know as well as I do. If it's a galvanized line, it's probably more like a half inch by now after eighty years. So. Absolutely, we we don't have any one-inch water mains in our system. I mean, this was a service line. And it may well have been put in to serve the northernmost house, and then the other two houses were built and attached onto it. And there are a lot of things that were allowed decades ago that <laughs> we don't allow anymore. That that we, as the waterworks and the current homeowners, are just kind of mopping up. And um, so, uh, I agree. It's it's a it's a bad situation. It's an unfortunate situation. As Mike said, it's not an uncommon situation and we do try to work with the customers. Um, but the process that we've described is what we have come up with and used in the past. You can certainly um, look at other options, but that's what the process has been recently. And Mike, you said that the total project cost for this is closer to around 10,000. I mean, sorry, 100,000. Yes, Andrea, if, if we installed 300 foot of eight inch water main on the west side of Southwest 12, we would, we're kind of guessing here a little bit, estimating, but yeah, something north of 100,000. And then if each customer paid, let's say each customer paid $3,500, you know, we'd, we'd garner back like maybe 10% of the overall project costs. And then the other part that we've typically put on the shoulders of the customers now you got the main in but you got to do a service transfer and again the opposite side service transfer cost on one of the most recent wmr jobs was, was almost five thousand dollars so you know that's how we easily get between five and ten thousand dollars on these situations is there is some legitimate expense there that is um i don't know we've tried to find the right balance this is kind of where we've landed at, as of late Mike, I just make sure I understand that the, the numbers you're talking about, we're going to put in a new water main, $100,000 of the pipe, and we're looking, uh, we've contemplated a $35,000 or $3,500 contribution from each customer for that. So that's that's their the contemplated contribution towards the new water main. Correct. So that's the first part, $3,500 for... Okay. participating at let's say a 10 percent level the, the rest of that is their service transfer cost or correct and that and that service transfer cost again on the most recent wmr was over forty five hundred dollars and is there a reason why we're putting it on the opposite side of the street from the three houses um that was just a, a very quick um you know google earth kind of review of that block and trying to see where eight inch water main would go in um, with the least amount of interference. Again, very coarse assessment, but that's that's the basis of it. Mike, um, tell me, because you know, we have a full agenda here tonight. Tell me the, the process here. I'm glad these three gentlemen came to make us aware of the situation, but tell us, because a couple of things they mentioned. One, 
they're worried about time and soon they're going to run out of water. So obviously time is of the essence. So I want to know that. And then also, I don't want to forget one of the things that they talked about. One of those gentlemen talked about was um, we put in a new main and then it breaks tomorrow. We're responsible for it. Am I right in assuming that once, once we installed this new main, it would be like any other main of ours, they would re be responsible uh, basically for that line that runs their house, which they could, they could have insurance on that. Am I thinking correctly? Or is there an added expense there that I'm missing? Yeah, let me clarify. If, if we went forward and we put in an eight inch water main in this street, that would be our burden moving forward, Graham. I think what Denny was saying is if that one inch private line is damaged today and they repair it. Okay. It could, it could very likely break a week later and they'd be repairing it again, again at, at their expense. And so that's what creates this kind of urgency from a time perspective is they really suspect it's probably going to fail at some point in time. And so they've done a great thing here. There's some unity. There's three customers. They're, they're willing to participate. Uh, right now, the, the initial number they've heard from us, again, following some common practices that we've kind of followed it just it's too big of a bite for them right now uh, even with you know we, we come up with some opportunities for them to pay that off over time but i still think that's just landing too too hard for them right now Graham. so you need to do you need to spend some time uh kind of narrowing in on the number correct mike and ted and then see what what we can do with these these homeowners is that am i thinking correctly we can review this um and see if there's any adjustment that we can do um again i'm happy to partake in some more internal discussions here ted okay, okay. would there be so, a reason you couldn't just do a dead end main like how we have now and install half the amount of pipe instead of you know, 300 feet, install 100, and that reduces your cost. Uh, obviously, I know connecting the two main, connecting the, the two lines helps, you know, everyone kind of in the area. So if pressure drops, you know, it keeps more constant pressure for everyone, but. That's an option to install a smaller amount of pipe uh, from a distribution connectivity perspective. That's, uh, we, we would probably call that atypical and, um, but it would result in an overall project cost of something less. That's that's acknowledged. Sue, you had a question. I, I do, um, and I, I'm not trying to push this off because it sounds like we have some things as, as a utility we're going to do. But also the Polk County Housing Trust Fund is a great organization that has about six nonprofits that work with them. Neighborhood Finance um, Corporation is one where they will give up to a $10,000 forgivable loan if it's for improvements on your property. Um, I don't know if you've checked into that at all, and I'd be happy to um, work with Amy and make a call to Eric Burmeister um, if, if that would be helpful just to see if there would be a way to offset it. But have you explored any of those other options for property owners in Des Moines? Well, I know there are different agencies out there that will help people like home improvements and stuff, but I don't know of anybody that would give you money for water line. Okay. Well, I think we need to explore that at the same time that we're doing all of the rest of this. And if we can, you know, obviously Mike has some things that he's going to check into and Ted, but um, Amy, I'd be happy to get on a call with you and call Eric and see if any of the nonprofits that do receive county funding um, if, if this kind of project would be eligible. Yeah, it would help. Great. You know, as I said, I worked at Waterworks for 29 years and I know two things about Waterworks for certain. They pride themselves on the quality of their water and their service to their customers. When the three of us, we're not seeing that good service. We want to be like everybody else in the city with good water pressure, good water volume, we just want to be included in that. We don't see it happening. Okay. All right. Well, Ted and Mike, you'll continue to work on this and work with these these homeowners and 
uh, hopefully you can find a solution or report back to us. Absolutely, Graham. We've got a few things we can take a look at. Um, and I, I think there's, there's going to be some, some costs associated with this unless we uh, decide to go a, a totally different direction with these. <clears throat> let, let us take a look and see what options we have and we can bring those back to the board. La Sorry, last that. quick question for me. Um, Mike, I thought I heard you say that this is something that would have to be a project of such an extent that would have to be bid. So regardless of who pays for it, if this one, if this we decided we were doing it tomorrow, how long would it take to get through the bidding project process, somebody selected and get somebody started on this project? Um, I'm gonna just put that at minimum, probably four to six months. Um, typically what we've done, again, sometimes trying to design one block for this issue alone, it's, it's almost better to have an existing contract. You know, we have water main replacement contracts that we bid each year. We've, what we've typically done is we've approached the awarded contractor and said, hey, we want to add 300 foot over here on Southwest 12th and negotiate a price with them to add it to the contract. Uh, we've done that. We could also, you know, push it into an existing contract, and uh, that's an option for us too. But that process is going to be in the four to six month window. I'm just wondering, since it sounds like time is of the the essence, if if as you guys are having these internal talks, if that could also be explored, so it, that's not further delayed for them, because I imagine, regardless um, of how this comes out, something is going to need to be done if if those three houses want to have access to water. Thank you. Yeah, one of the things that we've done, Andrea, in the past is if we come to consensus on what we're gonna do and what's gonna be paid by the property owners, we, we essentially warrant their service, that, that one inch line, that one inch service line. So if it breaks, we'll take care of it. Um, you know, we're not to that point on this particular one yet, but that's, that's a way that we have offered to, to help. Um, other customers in the past kind of mitigate that concern about it breaking while they're waiting the four to six months for us to get in there and get it done. But we just need to look for a solution that's acceptable to, to the, the customers there and, and move it forward. We just haven't quite gotten there yet. All right. Well, gentlemen, thank you for coming. We'll, uh, we'll continue to work with you and hopefully we'll find a solution. Well, is there any way we can communicate or we can find out what you're finding out on your end? If anything develops as far as what it's going to cost us or anything, we need Mike. to communicate. Yeah, I, I, I think we can commit to a, a response to Dennis before, before, before Christmas holiday. Was that fair enough? Or is that? Yeah, as long as you, you, know, you notify us to keep us in the you know, playing field, so we know what's going on. We can do that. Anything you can do will be appreciated. Yeah, Dennis, right. you and I, Dennis, you and I already have an email thread going on, so right. I'll just probably tack on to that as we. That's fine. Okay. I'll, I'll keep. Great. Thank you, gentlemen. Thanks for coming. Well, thank you for listening to us. Yeah. Right. Um, anyone, anyone else here from the public that wishes to address the board? Shell, do you see anybody? Sorry, I was muted. Um, no, those are my All right. three attendees here today. Graham? Yes. Graham? Um, yes. I, I see that we have Jody Smith on, and we have certainly talked about Jody a number of times, as well as the West Des Moines Waterworks. And, uh, for anyone that hasn't met him, I just I appreciate him being on this call as um, we work toward a possible solution. So I just wanted to acknowledge his presence on the line. All right. Uh, so item 3A is the agreement between Des Moines Waterworks and ASME Council 61 and its affiliated local 3861. Um, Ted, you, why don't you go ahead and tee this up for us and then I'll seek a motion. Absolutely, Graham. We, um, after a, a number of years without um, contract negotiation, uh, we had a five-year agreement and then that was extended. 
Uh, we did negotiate our uh, labor agreement again this year. This was the first time that we had negotiated a labor agreement since uh, the law changes um, here a couple, three years ago. Um, it was a successful negotiation. Um, we did uh, move ahead with negotiation on all the required topics of bargaining and all the permissive. So those that were eligible that didn't have to be bargained, we included all of those in the negotiation. And then the things that are prohibited have been moved out. We have a tentative um, five-year agreement uh, with the union. Um, they have ratified the change. Um, there are some sp specifics uh, in the memo that's behind the yellow uh, in terms of specific sections and how they were changed. Um, we can touch on a couple of those things. Um, as I said, there's a, a five-year agreement. Um, there were some changes in titles, both on the management side and on the union side, kind of throughout the document. I won't touch on all of those. They're all listed there though. Um, there was one small change in the discipline and discharge language related to the length of time that um, disciplinary action memos stay. Um, Five-year agreement, as I mentioned, and then there were updates to the wage schedule to reflect a 3% wage increase for each year in the first three years, and also an update to the sleep time schedule to reflect current practice. So. Um, the complete uh, contract document is attached. Um, things that have changed are in bold. Um, but at this point, we are asking the board to approve our agreement with ASME Council 61 for the next five years. So I'm seeking a motion to approve and authorize the chairperson to execute the agreement between Des Moines Water Works and ASME Council 61 and its affiliated local 3861, effective January 1st, 2022 through December 31st, 2026. Is there a motion to that effect? So moved. And a second. Comments, questions? Hearing none, hearing none. Uh, the only thing that I would want to share, Ted, you and I have had a number of conversations one-on-one, uh, -on -one, and I think it's uh, helpful to, to share some of that. There are a number of items that due to law changes and other things have been moved out of the collective bargaining process um, uh, you know, by law. And Ted, you know, I continue to encourage you as you, you know, as you go forward to have those discussions with the union and, and the rest of the employees about changes that are being made to the handbook, you know, changes that are being made to policy, um, uh, you understand, and I'm not, as I say, I'm, I'm saying publicly what you and I would discuss privately. You understand the importance of having that ongoing conversation uh, with employees so that they're part of the process and they understand where things are going in the, um, with utility. But I just kind of wanted to say that public so that other board members in the public are aware that um, uh, of your commitment to that, of your commitment to continue to have those conversations and uh, share your thinking and your management style. Agreed, Graham. The, the process, as you know, is ongoing. Um, there are things that are no longer um, permissible in the contract, and we're, we're trying to move those things as appropriate into the handbook. Um, it's a little bit challenging because the handbook um, relates to all employees, not just the bargaining employees, but we're committed to getting something that's appropriate for all employees that, that covers those things that have come out to the extent possible. And, and we're, we continue to work on that. Thank you for that. Any other comments or questions on item 3A? Hearing none, I'll have Michelle record the vote. Ashburn? Yes. Bolton? Yes. Gillette? Yes. Hubbard? Yes. Thank you. Item 3B is a motion to receive and file. Um, I'll have you explain this, Ted, and then I'll seek a motion. Graham, uh, 3B is uh, receive and file the Des Moines Waterworks 2021 strategic plan. And um, in the spring of this year, we uh, retained HDR Incorporated to facilitate a strategic planning process for the utility. This is something that 
Um, I had wanted to ensure that we accomplished this year um, to help chart the course for the utility going forward. Um, HDR did a great job of facilitating the process. They were able to collect an enormous amount of data from the community, from stakeholders, from employees, retirees. Um, I want to specifically thank Andrea Bolton uh, for serving on our community advisory committee, along with um, Lori Leo, who is there representing our union, Dylan White and Rochelle Besto, who were there representing our employees. We had uh, great interaction and, and the consultant said that we um, should be very pleased with the, the amount of response that we had, not only from our community, our, our employees, but also from the community. Um, we presented the strategic plan uh, at the planning committee meeting this month, um, along with um, strategic initiatives that are planned for the coming year and then some um, thoughts on out year strategic initiatives um, the, the actual document has been provided to each of the board members and, of course, is, is in the packet for everyone to review. Um, we look forward to implementing the strategic plan. We're actually working with HDR to help with uh, a, an ongoing facilitation plan, a, a series of short meetings through the coming year to help us stay on course. So um, at this point today, we are asking the board to receive and file the strategic plan, the Des Moines Waterworks 2021 strategic plan. And as I said, we look forward to beginning implementation at the first of the year. So I'm looking for a motion to receive and file the Des Moines Waterworks 2021 strategic plan. Is there a motion to that effect? Um, make that motion. All right, and a second? Second. And Andrea, it sounds like you might have something to say. Yeah, well, I just wanted uh, to add, I shared this you know, during our, um, planning committee, but, you know, as I wanted to echo some of the comments that Ted made, you know, that this is the first time in a long time that an outside consultant has led our strategic planning. And um, to me, that's something that's very important to note because it really shows that this isn't a, a plan of what we just want to hear, but how others see us in the path that, that um, they want us to take as a, as a leader in, um, in, um, in water utility. And as Ted said, I really am impressed with the, sorry, we might lose it over here in a second. Um, the level of engagement of the stakeholders from the community. Um, and I'm gonna probably cut my notes, my comments short, but uh, I think the takeaway that I really wanna express is that um, I think through the engagement of those in the community, what we really heard um, that the, that the charge we need to take, um, the charge that we need to be taking as leaders and advocates for water um, that we all can trust for life that fits with, you know, what we continue to share as our message. And at this um, moment, it's a very important message to that we're receiving from our stakeholders and customers. And that really is about um, engaging and communicating with with the people and being leaders and, and um, that voice in the community for water. So I'm really proud and impressed with the strategic plan and uh, so should all the staff and their hard work and so should the rest of the board members um, as this moves forward. Thank you, agreed. Joel, Sue, anything to add? All right, well, I agree with Andrea and I appreciate this, the hard work of everybody. If um, Let's see, I have a motion in a second. So, uh, Michelle, if you could record the vote. Ashburn? Yes. Bolton? Yes. Gillette? Yes. Hubbard? Yes. Okay. All righty. Um, item 3C is um, the 20, 2022 budget. Um, so, this, this is slightly different. This is a public hearing. So. I will open this public hearing uh, to see if there are any uh, comments from the public regarding the budget for 2022. Are there, is there anyone here from the public who wishes to speak on this item during the public hearing? Well, there was a deep breath there, but I don't know if there's any, anyone here. Is there anyone, Michelle, that I'm missing? No. Yeah. No, all right. So with that, I'll close the hearing. And I'll seek a motion for the, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to seek a motion and then we can have some discussion, but I'll seek a motion for the approval of the 2022 Des Moines Waterworks budget. Is there a motion to that effect? So 
moved. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. Um, Ted, I don't know if you have something to add, and I'll also open the floor for comments and questions. You know, Graham, I, I don't have a lot to add. We've talked about the budget um, a number of times now at recent committee meetings and whatnot. The one thing I do want to highlight today is that there's been a slight change. Um, you can see on screen the last paragraph there in the top box. Um, we had to make an adjustment of about $200,000 uh, from what was going into reserves. We lowered that amount a little bit to cover um, some fairly dramatic increases in chemical prices, which we will be talking about on the next item. Um, certainly not enough of an issue to uh, take the budget out of balance or cause any problems, but I, I draw the board's attention to that because it is different. Um, but otherwise, um, much as has been presented to the board already, happy to answer any specific questions that the board may have. Any comments or questions? I'll add briefly, we had a good uh, presentation and discussion about the budget at Finance and Audit, and um, happy to see this moving forward would uh, point to the expansion projects as an important and exciting aspect of this. Um, I think uh, it's an important to recognize how fast the region is growing, and I'm glad to see that we are uh, making some investments to keep up with that. Agreed. Any other comments or questions? All right, I'll ask Michelle to record a vote. Ashburn? I'm not hearing you very well, Joel, sorry. Yes. Thank you. Bolton? Yes. Gillette? Yes. Hubbard? Yes. Thank you. All righty, so uh, that moves us to item 3D. This is the 2022 water treatment chemicals analysis of biz, bids and authorized execution of contracts. Um, Ted, I will have you explain this before I seek a motion. Thank you, Graham. Yes, this is, uh, as I mentioned in the last item, um, a little bit of a surprise this year. We've had, we had some fairly significant um, chemical price increases. Um, individual chemicals are all listed there. Um, in the memo behind the, the cover sheet, it actually lists each chemical and the, and the percent increase that we saw in each chemical. And those ranged from 0% to 367% increase over uh, last year, with the average increase per chemical being about 48%. I do want to make a comment. There's a, a rather confusing note here. Um, there's an 81% figure in there that's misplaced. But if you take last year's chemical prices and apply them to the projected quantity of chemical that we have projected for the coming year, that equals 81% of what uh, the coming year's costs are going to be. So in other words, it's about a 19% increase. Um, it's a little, it's worded a little bit confusingly in, in the memo, but it, we're looking at almost a 20% increase uh, in chemical costs year over year. Uh, a lot of that is related to supply chain, specifically trucking issues. Um, we ask the, the vendors to guarantee their prices for a year. There's so much uncertainty out there. We're kind of paying the price for that, but um, about a 20% increase in chemical prices year over year. If you um, or include the, the total book of business there, you can see um, each of the prices uh, there listed for each chemical. Um, we feel like we've done our due diligence. We've gotten competitive quotes on every chemical. Um, these are what the prices are going to be. Uh, there's a lot of supporting information behind this cover sheet including our annual um, lime uh, analysis and our annual powdered activated carbon analysis. Most of the products, we just simply bid them um, based on the, the quantity we're gonna use and the unit price. Lime 
and powdered activated carbon, we actually do an effectiveness analysis. We have a third party contractor conduct that analysis and we base um, our recommendation on the most effective uh, per dollar uh, chemical. So all of that has been done. The result is what you see here. And we are asking the board to approve our, our chemical contracts for the coming year. And I'm seeking a motion to award the 2022 contracts for water treatment chemical supplies to the above bidders. I mean, those are the bidders that are listed on the sheet. Do I have a motion so, to that effect? So moved, Graham. And a second? Second. Any comments or questions on this item? Well, we haven't heard the word supply chain, and I'm just curious if the increased cost is what we're hearing about every other product. That has a lot to do with it, Sue. Um, the supply chain issues um, specifically uh, related to some of the chemicals that we, we actually use fairly sparingly, and, and that's a good thing. Um, citric acid is the chemical that is going up by 367%. Um, that's an availability and a supply chain issue to be sure. Some of the others that we use large quantities of, is, it's more of a trucking issue. It's the, the product is there. It's, it's, it's coming from uh, you know, Mississippi. Um, it's not coming from overseas or Canada or wherever. It's just a question of um, getting the trucks and the drivers to get it here. So um, kind of all of the above across this whole list of chemicals. But as I said, I, I think Julia does a great job of due diligence and, and kind of beating the bushes and trying to get multiple vendors to bid on all of the products. Um, it's a combination of things, but I would kind of categorize them all into the supply chain category. Any other comments or quite a, questions on item 3D? Hearing and seeing none, I'll ask Michelle to record the vote. Ashburn? Yes. Bolton? Yes. Gillette? Yes. Hubbard? Yes. Thank you. All right, item 3E is Warren Waterworks Rules and Regulations Update. Uh, Ted, again, I'll throw this over to you. Graham, every year we um, bring a, a series of proposed updates to our rules and regulations, the rules and regulations that primarily relate to um, water service and, and uh, receiving water service here um, in the city of Des Moines and, and our retail areas. Uh, all of the proposed changes to the rules and regs this year were reviewed at the November planning committee meeting. Um, there is a, a listing there of uh, a couple of the more significant changes you can see uh, related to um, adding a requirement that customers um, go through our appeal process before taking action in court, um, changing the amount of a plumber's bond based on um, the, the, the smallest size bond they can get, um, our ability to deny backflow texts from companies that are not doing a, a good job, uh, requiring larger size conduit, providing fee for unauthorized operation of our valves. Um, those are the major things. Um, they're really uh, fairly straightforward changes this year and not a lot of changes. Um, there's a lot of information in the packet, including a, a summary of all changes and actually a complete uh, set of the rules and regulations that has every change highlighted. We're asking for the board to approve the proposed re revisions uh, with an implementation date of January 1, specifically related to changes in fees. So what I'm seeking is a motion to approve the proposed revisions to the rules and regulations with an implementation date of January 1, 2022, and direct publication of the changes as required by statute. Is there a motion to that effect? I have okay. a motion from Joel and a second from Sue. Any comments or questions on this item? Hearing none, I'll have Michelle record the vote. Ashburn? Yes. Bolton? Yes. Gillette? Yes. Hubbard? Yes. 
moves us to item 3F, the acceptance of the 2021 tank painting, Pleasant Hill Tower in the Wilczynski standpipe. Ted? Graham, uh, thank you. Uh, hopefully you've all seen the, the towers that have been freshly painted. They look magnificent, I must say. Um, in January, what color are they? Cumulus. Oh. The Wilczynski standpipe is now cumulus, uh, which is... It's, it's stunning, I must say. It looks great. <laughs> this is, Ted, this is your great accomplishment. That's right. Go no ahead. More, Sorry to interrupt. No more, no more baby blue. Uh, in January, the board awarded this contract. Um, all of the work has been successfully completed. There were three no cost change orders, again, here, Sue, related to supply chain, believe it or not. We had specified a, a, a low VOC uh, paint products. Um, those were not readily available. Um, and so we used a more standard paint product that was more readily available and, and certainly uh, met all the air quality regs and all of those kind of things. Um, but there was no cost change. So the final uh, price is the same as the original contract price of uh, 1,145,552. And we are asking the board to accept 2021 tank painting project. I'm seeking a motion to accept the 2021 tank painting, Pleasant Hill Tower and Wilczynski Standpipe project completed by J.R. Stelzer Company in the amount of $1,145,524. Is there a motion to that effect? So moved. A motion from Randy and a second. 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 Second from Joel, any comments or questions on this item? or the color cumulus. Hearing none, I'll ask Michelle to record the vote. Ashburn? Yes. Bolton? Yes. Gillette? Yes. Hubbard? Yes. Item 3G, item 3G is a request to authorization for CEO and general manager to execute agreement for professional services for 2022 filter rehabilitation study. Ted? Graham, the filters here at the fluor drive treatment plant, many of them have been in service since the 1940s, some of them since the 1950s. They have been rehabilitated or modified a number of times in that period of time to ensure that they continued to perform. Uh, it is once again time to do some rehabilitation of those filters just due to the normal uh, aging process of, of infrastructure. Um, staff has issued an RFP for design firms to evaluate and make recommendations on uh, how those filters should be renewed, what if any a new or improved technology should be used, how we should move forward. Um, four proposals were received and reviewed by staff and based primarily on the strength of their team and firm experience, staff is recommending that the board award uh, this agreement to um, CDM Smith Incorporated amount of $146,200. So I'm seeking a motion to authorize the CEO and general manager to execute a professional services agreement with CDM Smith Incorporated for the 2022 filter rehabilitation study contingent upon negotiation of terms and conditions that are acceptable to staff and subsequent review by legal counsel. Is there a motion to that effect? So moved. And a second. Second. And a second from Joel. Any comments or questions on item 3G? Hearing none, I'll ask Michelle to record the vote. Ashburner? Bolton? Yes. Gillette? Yes. Hubbard? Yes. Item 3H is request authorization to reimburse the city of Des Moines for, uh, for water main relocations for Hamilton drain stormwater improvements phase two. Ted? Very typical project here, Graham. The, the city of Des Moines is, is doing a number of stormwater improvements across the city. There's a map that shows the numerous locations involved in this project. And in many of those locations, um, water main alterations will be part of the required work. 
Um, the city has contracted with that based or contracted for that storm sewer work, including the water main alterations based on the unit prices they received. Uh, we anticipate um, reimbursing the city um, just over $346,000 at the conclusion of the project. This is actually expected to be a multi-year project starting as soon as next month and continuing through uh, 2023, but we're asking uh, permission to reimburse the city for those water main alterations once the project is complete. So I'm seeking a motion to authorize staff to reimburse the city of Des Moines for water main relocations included in the Hamilton Drain Storm Water Improvements Phase Two project. Is there a motion to that effect? Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Do I have a, and I have a second. Any comments or questions about item 3H? Hearing none, I'll have Michelle record the vote. Ashburn? Yes. Bolton? Yes. Gillette? Yes. Hubbard? Yes. All right, so this moves us to item 3I, uh, which is a request authorization to solicit bids for the Fleur Drive Operations Center Stormwater System Improvements Phase 2 and establish the date of the public hearing as the date of the January 22, 2022 board meeting. Ted? Graham, stormwater inside the ring levee at the Fleur Drive plant has long been a problem uh, during flood conditions when rainwater will not drain naturally to the river because the river is too high. A study completed in 2014 proposed a number of improvements. In 2016, we upsized a number of pipe segments inside the plant to carry more stormwater to the stormwater pump station. Uh, now we are nearly complete with plans to upsize the stormwater pump station itself. Uh, today, staff is requesting permission to solicit bids for that stormwater uh, pump station project. We'll bring bids back uh, next month. So I'm seeking Actually, a motion yeah, to also- I'm sorry, Graham, I'm sorry. Yes. We'll bring bids back in January, I'm sorry. In January. So I'm seeking a motion to authorize staff to solicit bids for the Fluor Drive Operations Center Stormwater Systems, System Improvements phase two contract and establish the date of the public hearing as the date of the January 2022 board meeting and direct staff to publish notice as provided by law. Is there a motion to that effect? So moved. A motion from two and a second. Second. And a second. Any comments or questions on item three I? I just have a question. I know when we go Please. from one year to the next, are the funds truly coming from the 2021 facility management budget? It sounds like an awful lot of soliciting bids and getting the work done for it to all be done by the end of June. I just wanted to make sure we didn't have a typo there. Um, I, I believe the, the memo is, is correct, Sue. The, the funds were budgeted in the 2021 facility management budget. We will, of course, carry those over into the next year so that they are available. Um, Mike, any clarifications there that need to be made? Uh, no, I just poke fun at Sue. She's going to get me in trouble with my finance colleagues there. So, uh, but good question. Yeah, we, they, they, uh, we will carry those funds over, Sue. They will clearly, they'll be expended in 2022, but they were budgeted in 2021. Excellent. Any other questions on this item? All right, here again, I'll have Michelle record the vote. Ashburner? Yes. Holton? Yes. Gillette? Yes. Hubbard? Yes. Yep. So item 3J is request permission to establish the date of a public hearing for Mid-American Energy Company electric transmission line easement as the date of the December 2021 board meeting. Ted? Graham, this is uh, a public hearing. Uh, Mid-American Energy needs to move some uh, overhead transmission. I think this is related to reconstruction of the 63rd Street Bridge over the Raccoon River. Um, these uh, transmission lines will actually just pass over the property. So this is, is an overhead 
uh, easement. We'll have more details on this next month, uh, but we're just today we're just asking the board to establish a public hearing for next month. All right, so I'm seeking a motion to establish the date of the December 2021 board meeting as a date of public hearing for Mid-American Energy Company electric transmission line easement and direct staff to publish notice as provided by law. Is there a motion to that effect? So moved. This motion is, I have a motion from Joel and do I have a second? Second. And a second from Sue. Any comments, questions, thoughts on this item? Hearing none, I'll have Michelle record the vote. Ashburn? Yes. Fulton? Yes. Colette? Yes. Hubbard? Yes. And that passes. So that's item 3K, moves to item 3K, request permission to establish the date of the public hearing for Mid-American Company gas easement as the date of December 2021 board meeting. Ted, I kind of think this one seems similar. It's uh, very similar, Graham, other than this is gas main that will be buried on our property for, uh, as a result of the same project. They're moving a 16-inch gas main from the west side to the east side. Um, we'll have more details next month. Today, we're simply asking the board to establish the date of public hearing for next month. All right. So I'm seeking a motion to establish the date of the December 2021 board meeting as the date of the public hearing for Mid-American Energy Company gas easement and direct staff to publish notice as provided by law. Is there a motion to that effect? So moved. Motion uh, and a second. Any comments or questions on item 3K? Hearing none, I'll ask Michelle to record the vote. Ashburn? Yes. Fulton? Yes. Gillette? Yes. Hubbard? Yes. All right. And that moves us to item 3L. This is the award LP Moon Pumping Station Pump Number 8 contract, Ted. Well, I guess this is a public hearing, so bear with me for a moment. Again, this item is the to award the LP Moon Pumping Station Pump Number 8 contract. And I will open the public comment to see if there are any comments from the public regarding the form of contract plans, specifications, and estimated cost. Is there anyone here who wishes to address this item or Ted, have we received any comments? Graham, we have received no comments. And no comments. Thank you. So with that, I will close the public hearing and I will seek a motion for adoption of the form of contract plans and specifications and estimated cost. Is there a motion to those effect? Is there a motion to that effect? So moved. And a second. Second. And I have a motion and a second. Any comments or questions? Hearing none, I'll have Michelle record the vote. Ashburn? Yes. Fulton? Yes. Gillette? Yes. Hubbard? So we can't hear you. That's because I'm trying to chat with Amy in the chat. And if you are chatting, you cannot mute, unmute your phone. So uh -huh. FYI, don't chat with Amy. Oh, it's always Amy's fault. Um, all right. So we have Is that. So yes? now an analysis of the bids, please, Ted. Graham. Um, this in October, staff requested permission to solicit bids for this project. Uh, the pump, this pump is going to provide redundancy to the Clive West Des Moines Waukee side of the pump station. Um, eight contractors attended the pre bid conference, and four bids were received on November 16th. You can see the list uh, of bidders there. Um, the engineer's estimate for the project was $170,000. The low bid submitted by Waldinger. Uh, corporation is $123,390. Um, Waldinger Corporation has successfully completed many projects for Des Moines Waterworks and staff recommends that the board award the project to Waldinger. So I'm seeking a motion to award the LP Moon Pumping Station Pump Number 8 contract to the Waldinger Co Corporation in the amount of $123,390 
and authorize the chairperson and CEO and general manager to execute to execute the contract. Is uh, there a motion to that effect? So moved. Motion and a second. Second. And a second. Any comments or questions on item three L? Hearing that none, I'll have Michelle record the vote. Ashburn. Yes. Colton. Yes. Gillette. Yes. Hubbard. Yes. All right, so item 3M is relatively easy. Uh, this is a proposed 2022 schedules for the Board of Waterworks trustees and committee meetings. There is an attached sheet that shows those proposed dates. And I'm seeking a motion to adopt the proposed 2022 schedules for the Board of Waterworks trustees and committee meetings. Is there a motion to that effect? So moved. Motion and a second. Okay. Any any comments, questions on this one? Hearing none, I'll have Michelle record that vote. Ashburner? Yes. Bolton? Yes. Gillette? Yes. Hubbard? Yes. All right. And our final item, uh, action item, is to receive and file re <laughs> regionalization receive and file regionalization microgroup outcomes document. Ted, I'll have you explain uh, what we're doing here. Absolutely, Graham. Um, as the board is well aware in 2017, Des Moines Waterworks began this process of, of discussing the creation of a regional production entity uh, in the Des Moines metro area. Uh, this board issued a term sheet in September of 2019. It was a very high level framework in, uh, intended to be a, a, a basis that could be used for developing such an entity. Um, that uh, term sheet resulted in a lot of questions. Uh, we were just beginning to uh, discuss those questions when the, the pandemic sort of um, stifled uh, discussion. But in July of 2020, the three board managed utilities formed what we called a micro group and the micro group met uh, on a regular basis for uh, almost two years, um, weekly, sometimes more than weekly, um, discussing um, all of the questions that have been raised in, in addition to others, um, trying to uh, put some, some meat on the bones, if you will, of that original term sheet, trying to um, talk through and document um, a number of important factors uh, in terms of the, the creation of this regional production entity. Uh, that micro group was a, a good cross-sectional representation of the Des Moines Metro. We had producers and non-producers, asset owners and non-asset owners, um, growing communities and communities that weren't growing as fast. We had excellent discussions, um, in my opinion. Uh, the micro group initially summarized their discussions in April of 2020, um, is that right? Uh, there was an initial summary, let's say that, um, the record, but that report included a short list of, of open items. Um, we continue to discuss those through the summer, mostly through letters, but we met recently and it really resolved um, all of the outstanding issues in terms of uh, basic understanding of, of how things could work, how a regional production entity could be created. Um, the, the outcomes document has been revised as of this month to reflect all of the discussions that that group has had. Um, we've also created a founding resolution now that will be considered in the coming month. But today um, we're here asking that the Board of Waterworks Trustees, the City of Des Moines, receive and file that regionalization micro group document to, to bring that, that phase of the process to a close, allow us to move forward into the next very exciting phase of the process, which will be um, developing an, an actual 28E agreement that can guide the formation of this regional entity. So Graham, today um, we're here to ask the board to receive and file the document. I'm seeking a motion to receive and file the regionalization microgroup outcomes document. Is there a motion to that effect? Yes. I have an enthusiastic uh, yes from, from Sue. Is there a second? Second. 
in a second. Any comments or questions on this item? Share Sue's enthusiasm. There you go. Um, I thought it would be uh, maybe so uh, worth our while to talk a little bit about timing. Um, Ted and Andrea and I and Ted and Diane and I and others have kind of talked out the next couple of months. And um, here's what I think we can see happening. At our, on our December agenda, there'll be a, um, uh, a document, if you will, for us to approve um, kind of a, what are we calling this, Ted? A um, founding resolution. A founding resolution that basically um, provides our board an opportunity to um, voice our intent to move forward with, uh, with regionalization. We hope that uh, West Des Moines Waterworks and Urbandale Waterworks will do the same at about the same time in December. And we hope that the, the uh, other communities around the region will pass that resolution in the first part of 2022. So at our December meeting, we'll have an opportunity to talk a little bit more in depth about uh, regionalization next steps and uh, how we're gonna approach this. I intend uh, in December that we probably will have a special board meeting uh, where we can go through the 28E document that Rick Mom has been drafting. Um, I did this in part because I'm not sure we're quite ready to do it in December. I know Joel, for one, has other things scheduled for December. Um, and so, and I don't think uh, it's that closed session will be lengthy enough that I, I don't think we want to piggyback it on our regular meeting. So we'll work with people's schedules to get that closed session. And we may, I've asked Rick to think about this. We possibly might actually try to do it in two sessions. I mean, the 2080 is such a big document. I don't necessarily want us to sit around for multiple hours and uh, become exhausted on the document. It would be better to, to break it up in short sessions. So we may break it up into two sessions so that the board has enough time to go through the 2080. Um, whether it's one or two sessions, it would be on my hope then that um, following that closed session or sessions, um, our board would, would be in a position to approve the 28E publicly uh, and put that out to the rest of the communities um, uh, so that they can begin evaluating and looking at that. So that would mean if we do this correctly, that you know January, maybe February, the 2080 would be a living document that is out in the communities, um, allow people some time to, to sign that. Um, I know Jody Smith and, and others agree with the fact that it would be the goal to, to get that thing uh, passed as quickly as possible um, so that uh, we could have signatures possibly by the third quarter of 2022, uh, with a regional board being seated in uh, the first part of 2023. So that is the agenda as it stands now. Do I have any comments or questions on that? Uh, Graham, just a question. Do you have a week in mind in December? We all know how busy December is, when you might be bringing us together. And secondly, yep. would we have the document ahead of time to review? Yes. The closed session would be in January, not in December. Um, the so special we'll, we'll, meeting, though, that you're saying the special meeting to two. The special meeting would be in January. Got it. Thank you. We won't be we won't be ready in December, and just for that reason, as I say, Joel has, uh, in particular, has a lot planned for December, so we're going to push that off till till January. And I'll work with Ted on that. Probably where I don't know, Ted. We'll we'll work on maybe where an existing committee meeting is or something like that. I think that's exactly right, Graham. We, um, Rick and Amy and I and Kyle met today uh, to talk specifically about that. And I look forward to talking to you to get that scheduled. Okay. And Sue, we do expect to circulate a draft before the review meeting also. Yep. I think that's important, Sue, because um, hopefully people have time to review that. We'll, we'll focus in on where those those real problem areas are, if there are any, and be able to come to those meetings with questions in hand. Any other comments or questions about this item uh, of receiving and filing the regionalization microgroup uh, document or on our schedule, proposed schedule? Graham, just once again, I want to thank um, Jody Smith, who is on the call for bringing together 
the micro group. Um, I think you all know it was really his idea to say, let's get a smaller group of individuals and really carve this out. And it was in the middle of COVID. Um, so I, just, I appreciate that. And I appreciate what you've done, what Andrea's done and Ted. Um, I mean, everyone's been involved in this. So um, it's just, this is a great thing to have before us right before Thanksgiving. So thank you to everyone. It actually takes many villages to requote Hillary Clinton to make this thing work, um, Sue. And um, the the uh, document that we will review in December, um, you know, having each part potential participating entity uh, pass this, you know, uh, formula formulating document is an important step. And that also was uh, came out of a, a discussion with Jody. So um, it's all part of the process. All right, with that being said, I'll ask uh, Michelle to record the vote. Ashburn. Yes. Holton. Yes. Gillette. Yes. Hubbard. Yes. All right, so now that moves us into our information items. Um, the planning committee, um, any report from the planning committee this month? I think that you guys have tapped um, everything that we discussed in our committee as action items here today. So I don't have anything else to add. Thank you. And that may be the same for the finance and audit committee, right, Joel? That's right. We discussed the budget, which we adopted today. And customer relations committee did not meet, but um, one of the things that we did discuss is that, and you'll notice in your, in your, um, uh, planning documents for next year, your scheduling documents for next year is that we haven't scheduled customer relations committee on a regular schedule. We, we anticipate scheduling those on an ad as, as needed basis. Um, Bill Stowe Memorial Committee, uh, we continue to have some interesting meetings there, but not ready to come back to you yet. Um, the Greater Des Moines Botanical Garden, I know that Jen and Ted and I and maybe others can um, testify that they had a great annual event. Their champagne and chocolate event was on Friday night. Uh, it was a great success. Um, it shows off the, uh, the Botanical Garden as a premier event venue. Uh, and it was a lot of fun. Was it? Uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun. Uh, Des Moines Waterworks Park Foundation, Joel, Andrea. Um, uh, the minutes of their last meeting are in our packet. Um, you know, a good chunk of the time was was spent talking about our, our mission and vision moving forward. Um, and also, you know, just again, continuing to push on the development and fundraising and closing out those, uh, those items. I don't know, Joel, if you have anything else you want to add? I think that's, I would echo that good discussion on the vision and mission development, um, pushing forward with the effort on, uh, Fundraising specifically getting all board members to have uh, made a commitment or donation uh, so the foundation can, um, you know, use that as a selling point when they go out to other donors. And then um, some um, amendments to um, kind of, the I think it's maybe the committee structure and just the, the governance committee had some uh, changes uh, that I think will kind of maybe streamline or help with the integration of new committee members or new board members. Um, so lots of, uh, lots of items. Great. Um, external affairs, Jen, do you have something to share? Thanks, Graham. Uh, just a couple of things, uh, unless you have been living under the proverbial rock for the last couple of weeks. Uh, Congress passed the Bipartisan Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act on November 6th. President Biden signed the bill on November 10th. And um, just a quick highlight of what that could mean uh, for us, maybe. Um, in the bill, there's $14.6 billion authorized for drinking water state revolving funds through 2026, uh, $11.7 billion for the drinking water state revolving loan fund, 49%, which we would be in the form of grants or loans with principal forgiveness. And my understanding is that those will be um, available for new uh, or existing infrastructure. 
uh, $15 billion for lead service line replacement, again, with 49% to be in the form of grants or loans with principal forgiveness. Uh, because of the way the funding is structured through the SRF this time around, we might not encounter the same roadblocks that we faced with recent federal funding, such as the American Rescue Plan Act. Uh, Amy and Mike did meet with the Iowa Finance Authority and the DNR yesterday to gain an initial understanding of the funding opportunities. Uh, the guidelines won't be released until January, so we will all and they will all know more at that time, but we do understand that it can be used for newer existing, which is good news for us. Uh, we've also been working with our congressional delegation and agencies to advise them that our customers own their own lead service lines, and so funding will need to be made accessible to, uh, to them for those replacements, uh, however that plays out. And then the other thing I would uh, touch on is PFAS. So the Senate has been working on the Defense Authorization Act in, uh, in which there are some amendments related to PFAS. When Senator Ernst was here on her tour a month or two ago, she was made aware of our issues uh, with PFAS in our water source. And she uh, has been working to get some amendments in the bill that would help the Air National Guards to deal with remedial investigations and mitigation measures, which would be helpful to our situation. So that's good news. It was held up a little bit because of the holiday, but it's going to go to the House and it should be done by year end 2021. Uh, and then we'll know more about that uh, as that rolls out. And I think that's it for me. Thank you. Great, thanks. Ted, I'm, I'm reluctant to point over to the uh, recordable injuries for the year because I don't want to jinx it before the year's out, but I did notice that it was still at four. Very good number, Graham. Obviously, we don't. We would prefer not to hurt anyone uh, or have anyone get hurt, but four is uh, dramatically below the average for a utility our size. We're very proud of that and hopeful that we can sustain that level for one more month. Excellent. And I'll turn it over to you, Ted, for final comments. Two quick things, Graham. The uh, Iowa Department of Natural Resources has developed a PFAS action plan. Jen mentioned a little bit about what's going on nationally, but here in the state of Iowa, DNR is doing um, some sampling and they've started with surface water utilities of which we are one, of course. First round of sampling included uh, fluor drive sources and finished, McMullen treatment plant sources and finished. Um, very positive results for us. There are some minor detects in the uh, source waters for the fluor drive plant. Um, one of the myriad of compounds that they tested for was detected just at the detection limit, 1.9 parts per trillion in the finished water. Extremely low levels, um, good outcome for us in that first round of testing. Nothing was detected at the McMullen plant in source or finished uh, whatsoever. So, so far so good there, very positive outcomes from their initial rounds of testing. Of course, we've been doing our own very proactive testing for a couple of years now and their results mirror ours and that's a positive. Second thing I wanted to give the board a quick update on the COVID-19 uh, testing requirements that are being implemented through the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. Those regulations were published in the Federal Register on November 4th, I believe. Uh, they had two uh, timeline goals in there uh, within one month. Um, all uh, employers that employ more than 100 employees are expected to develop a policy for mandatory testing of, of all of their employees. We're working diligently on, on that right now, even though there has been a stay and there's a pause there. Uh, we have been advised to, to continue moving forward with the development of the policy so that it will be in place and available if and when um, the courts decide how they're gonna move forward. The second deadline in there was um, a two month deadline for actual implementation of that policy, which would uh, put implementation at January 4th or 5th of, of the coming year. So um, we're staying up to date on that. We're, we're uh, planning to comply with the rules once we know for sure what they are. We have uh, polled our employees and we know who's vaccinated and who is going to need testing. And so we're trying to be prepared. Uh, we continue to be very fortunate on the COVID front. I'm not aware that we have any employees who are currently uh, affected or in quarantine because of COVID. So that, that's very positive. We're hopeful that continues into the fall and through the winter. Um, but whatever the case, uh, when the rules are established, we will uh, get them in implemented and follow them as required. So 
Um, I think that's it for me, Graham, unless there are questions on any of that. Ted, I do have a question or I guess a comment. Um, we've been working on the compliance for the OSHA rules and it's very labor intensive. And I'm looking at Doug Garnett's name here as I say that it's just, it's mind boggling when you think about the amount of records and a weekly testing, but um, we've done some, some investigation at DMU regarding some of the software available that would help enhance that and we'd be more than happy to share some of that information. Doug, if that would be helpful at all. Thank you, Sue. Um, Doug, any, any follow-up there? Uh, no, I do appreciate that though. Thank you, Sue. Yeah, it's, it's a bit onerous. Um, we do have a number of employees who are likely to choose testing and um, there's a significant amount of tracking and confirmation required. So uh, appreciate that. All right, well, Ted, thank you. It is Thanksgiving week. I hope everybody has a happy Thanksgiving. We all have a lot to be thankful for at Waterworks uh, from our employees and uh, from all of all the board members that dedicate their time. Um, we have a lot to be thankful for, so. With that, do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. And a second? Second. And a, and a thumbs up. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a great Thanksgiving. Thank you. You too. Thank you.